بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الكريم. Welcome to our first episode of Life's Adornments. I'm your host Yusuf Karma, where we'll be discussing life's adornments, the beauty of this life. Oftentimes when we hear adornments, we think of wealth, we think of materialistic things. Uh, however, there are things in life that are more valuable than money, things that will benefit us in this life and the next. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Al-Mal wal Banun Zina to Hayat Dunya. Also in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so in this beautiful episode in the series, we'll be discussing the wealth of children, how precious children are, and how do we properly invest in these in the in this in this uh, in this valuable thing, think something that's invaluable that will benefit us in this life and the next. So we have on this wonderful series with us here our, our Sheikh, our teacher, Sheikh Asim Lukman al Hakim. And as we know, uh, Sheikh Asim is a teacher at Zad Academy. He is also a teacher at Knowledge International University. And he has been an imam and a khatib and a teacher for over 32 years. Walillahi alhamd. So without further ado, we'd like, we'd like to introduce our teacher and our guest, Sheikh Asim. Jazakumullah khair for having me. And it's a pleasure being here. No, it's an absolute pleasure. So let's get directly into the matter, inshallah ta'ala. What are some ways that we can uh, invest and, t and take care of the, the valuable commodity of children and our offspring. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa manih tada bihudahu amma ba'd. Children are a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. As you, Zakallah khair, quoted, al-malu wal-banoon zinatu al-hayat al-dunya. Wealth and offspring are the adornments of life. Now, we're talking about life and not the hereafter. Mm -hmm. So on earth, this is a transitional period. We live of an average between 60 and 70 years, mm -hmm. as the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam. Yet, while living this life, we think that we are here to stay. And this is not true. Eventually, we have to die. And when we die, as the kids know, game over. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's not over. It's over on earth. But the real game, the real life, starts after death. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing at the moment on this earth is investing. We're investing our times. We're investing our wealth. We are investing our health. Yet some of us may be wasting all of that. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us something that all humans agree. So if you ask the vast majority of people, what is your wish in life? The vast majority would say, dinaros, yeah. money. Mm -hmm. We want green banknotes. Mm -hmm. This is what counts. This is what I can buy a private air, a jet plane. I can buy a mansion. I can marry the most beautiful woman, even if I'm the most ugliest guy <laughs> on, sure. on earth. This is mm -hmm. what makes people happy, so they think. But Allah Azza wa acknowledges this and tells us that it is among the adornments of life. This is a separate issue, mm -hmm. which we'll not go and discuss. What we are interested in discussing is the issue of offspring, children. Any couple would hope and wish to be blessed with a child. Yes. And this is universal, whether it's in China or it's in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's a human nature that we try to reproduce. It's in us. Maybe a guy is a irresponsible person, yet he would like to have an offspring of his own. So Islam looks at this fact, acknowledges it, but like all types of desires and needs for humans, channels it, it utilizes it. Yeah. So human beings, they seek to
to have their pleasure through sexual relationships. Islam doesn't tell you, you cannot have this, you must not have this, you must purify yourself and remain uh, uh, celibate, I think they call yeah, celibate, it, yes. yeah, w w without getting married, no, no, no. And at the same time, it tells you, do not engage in fornication mm -hmm. like animals. It channels it into telling you, you have to go through what is known as a marriage uh, uh, institution. Get married. Fulfill your desires through halal means. So Islam looks at this and channels it for us. The offspring is one of the things that Islam has placed a lot of responsibility. And there are so many types of etiquettes that governs how to take care of your children from the very beginning, from the very start. Yeah. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum. Protect yourselves and your families, which includes the wives, the spouses, and the offspring. From what? From hellfire. So Allah is giving us this warning twice in the Quran to protect us ourselves and our offspring and families from hellfire. So how to do that? This is inshallah what we will try to explain from the very, very beginning, which is even before having offspring. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm made to remember a story of, of a man, a very famous story of the man who came to Umar ibn Khattab and he was complaining about his son being naughty. And Umar ibn Khattab, as we know, he was going to punish his son. He had a low tolerance for foolishness. And the young boy said, you know, before you punish me, could you at least tell me what are the rights of the, uh, the, the parents on the child? Or the, does the child have rights over the parents, rather? And he said, yes. The first one is that the father should marry a righteous spouse. And he said, the second one is that he should give him a good name. And the third is that he should teach him something from Al-Quran or from Kitab and Sunnah. And, he, and the young boy said, as for my mother, she's a fire worshiper. And he said, the second thing, my father named me Jo'la, which is a cockroach, mm -hmm. <laughs> a little cockroach. Or a beetle. Or a beetle, a little yeah. bug or something like this. And the third thing, he said, my father never taught me anything from the Quran. So uh, uh, as the, the, the story mentions, he said that you, you disobeyed him before he disobeyed you. So many times we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessings, whether it's money, whether it's offspring, whether it's position, it's uh, job opportunity. But with those blessings come responsibility, as you mentioned. Correct. So uh, as we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessings, how are we at the same time preparing ourselves to b have gratitude for those blessings, to preserve those blessings, to increase it, to make sure that we are properly thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it and showing responsibility for it. Uh, so beginning from the very first step in choosing a spouse and creating the proper, uh, be a, if you will, environment to bring a child into it, how do we prepare for those things? Well, this needs a series All of its own. Yeah. And I remember <coughs> that one of the scholars, it might be Malik ibn Nabi or someone else, he was approached by a, a, a man, mm -hmm. a newlywed. Mm -hmm. So he said, Sheikh, I'd like to raise my child upon the right and correct way to be righteous and to be among the Salaf mm. way followers. So he said, how old is your chi uh, child? He said, four months old. He said, you're too late. Mm -hmm. So this is an eye opener. In order to have righteous offspring, mm -hmm. there are prerequisites, not necessarily that these prerequisites can be fulfilled and also not necessarily when fulfilled the results will be positive you have Nuh peace be upon him everything was fulfilled except that Allah did not will his son to be among the saved and righteous yeah, so he died a kafir mm. no one can accuse Nuh peace be upon him that he did not do the right thing or that did not uh, who failed to upbring his son a'udhu billah he's a a messenger among the uh, strong-willed mm -hmm. messengers. So there are means. We have to try and achieve them, fulfill them, and make dua that Allah accepts them. And at the end of the day, 
we may be, uh, or it might, it might be fruitful, but if it's not, it is definitely rewardable. Mm -hmm. So even if you fail in fulfilling your objectives in this life, you are certain to be rewarded. Not only that, you won't be held accountable because as you said, with great responsibilities mm -hmm. come, uh, uh, with great powers come great responsibilities. By the way, I, I Googled this once. I, I was thinking who uh, um, scholar, which scholar did this, and I was shocked to find that it was in Spider-Man no, uh, uh, comic books. Oh, so really? yeah, <laughs> with great powers come great responsibilities. Yeah. So I, I tried my <laughs> level to best to refrain from using that mm -hmm. phrase, but it's true. Spider-Man, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it is true. <laughs> yeah. So we, we take the wisdom wherever it is. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, maybe that's some tarbiyah in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Uh, so this is good. So prior to a person having child, uh, a child, should they engage in a sort of like tazkiyah to nafs or something like this and within themselves even before they go to engage to getting married and to having children and things of this nature? First of all, this cannot be an objective. Mm. This by itself is the essence of Islam. Mm. So no one does this in order that Allah would grant him of, uh, uh, a righteous offspring. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not righteous yourself, you can't have this intention because then you won't, won't be worshiping Allah yeah. properly. Yeah. So your intention is to be sincere, mm -hmm. to be a practicing mus Muslim, to be a role model in order to please Allah. Mm -hmm. And once Allah is pleased with you, things will definitely develop. So first of all, yes, Look at the, the, the story of Al-Khidr mm. with, with Musa and the two orphans. Allah Azza wa Jal preserved a treasure for them under a wall which was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. So when Al-Khidr built it up again and Musa asked, why are you doing this for free? He said that their father, and in some trans, uh, uh, interpretations of tafsir, mm -hmm. their seventh grandfather, Allah was righteous wow. and Allah Azza wa wanted to bless these two orphans because of the righteousness of their father or their seventh grandfather which means that yes if you are righteous uh, on your own this would resonate it would radiate mm -hmm. goodness to all of your offspring. Yes. Bismillah mashallah we're going to pause for a short break and we will return back for more of this episode uh, inshallah ta'ala, you all benefit. We will see you soon. Stay, stay, stay tuned. Bismillah ar rahim Welcome back to our second segment of Life's Adornments. We've been talking thus far about making the investment in uh, upraising children and upraising righteous offspring. Now, as we talk about an investment, of course, in economics, everyone wants to know, what is the return on my investment? Why am I uh, investing so much time, so much effort, blood, sweat, and tears in making sure that I have righteous offspring? So we would like to ask our, our guest and our teacher, Sheikh Asim, what are the merits, what are the incentives for a person to raise righteous offspring? Okay, there are so many. And if you recall, in the beginning, we talked about how many years are left for us on earth mm -hmm. and the average lifespan of a person on earth. After our death, each and everyone wants to leave a legacy. Yeah. So movie actors, their legacy is the movies they leave behind, mm -hmm. not knowing that this would add to their sins while they are dead in their graves because it's continuous. Um, a, a songwriter does the same thing with his song. Uh, someone who builds a monument or a building and it lasts for centuries. This is a legacy, a painting of Michelangelo mm -hmm. or of Da Vinci. When you see the Mona Lisa, wow. This is their legacy. As Muslims, our legacy is focused on three things, which the Prophet ﷺ beautifully 
illustrated when he said, when an individual dies, mm -hmm. all his good deeds, of course, and bad deeds, but we're talking about good deeds, are cut with the except, except, uh, exception of three. Number one, continuous charity. And what we mean by continuous charity, building a masjid. Yes, sir. So this is continuous because people are benefiting from this particular good deed every single day, 360 days a year. Yeah. Allah knows how many years. Then he says, beneficial knowledge. And this is for Islamic knowledge. So I write a book. I give a lecture that people circulate. This program of ours is part of beneficial knowledge, mm -hmm. inshallah. Mm -hmm. I hope it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah. So even throughout the years, people click on YouTube, they see the program, they manage to utilize it in upbringing their children in an Islamic way. We, both of us, are being paid, inshallah, while we are in our graves. Thirdly, the Prophet said, and a said righteous so. offspring mm. making dua for mm. you. Whether a boy or a girl, in Arabic refers to both genders, mm. men and women, boys and girls. Allah says in Surah An Nisa, chapter 4, Yusikum Allahu fi awladikum li dhakari mithlu hadhi al unthain. A lot of the Arabs nowadays think that walad means a, a, boy. a boy, a male, which is not true. So this is one of the biggest merits that when you die and people see your children, they say, oh, mashaAllah, tabarakallah. Whose son is this? Yeah, subhanAllah. They say, well, uh, the son of Sheikh Asim. MashaAllah, may Allah have mercy on his soul. He uh, 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 managed to raise a righteous imam, mm. a good mujahid, a good scholar, a good human being. The, the worst it could be, he's a good human being. No sins in public. Mm. And the guy is, moral conduct is excellent. Likewise with girls. But if it's the opposite, then you are in, this is bad news. Yes, well. Because if he was an evil child, they said, Audu Billah, what kind of a man is he? What kind of a woman is she? They're deviant, they're bad, they're evil. Whose father uh, uh, are theirs? And they say, Wallah, Sheikh Asim, they say, A'udhu Billah. And they curse you or they say something about, bad about you. So one of the biggest merits is that you leave a legacy behind yes, you. Sir. Mm. Um, if we were to move on, there is a second merit out of investing in your children is that you manage to convey and relay the message. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet says oh, in an Allah. authentic hadith, whoever directs others to goodness, Allah will reward him with the amount of goodness they do without deducting any of their rewards. So I teach my child Al-Fatiha. Mm -hmm. And this is, by the way, one of the problems and the means of dispute among righteous spouses, a man and his wife, they fight over who teaches their son the Fatiha first, Allah. because they know the reward. So the mother says, no, 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 I'm gonna teach my son Al-Fatiha and I'm gonna spend with him like six hours a day mm -hmm. just to make him repeat it so that throughout his life, whenever he recites the Fatiha, I'll be accredited for it. And the father says, no, 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 I'll take him to the tahfiz circle in the masjid yeah. where they teach him and I'll get the reward. And inshallah, both of them are yeah. rewarded. Yeah. But imagine when you manage to install and program your child to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I remember a lot of good righteous couples teaching their two years old child to say la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah i saw once a, a, a sister and her child was maybe a, a, a year and a half or two years she asks him the question of the prophet which a lot of the grown-ups don't mm -hmm. even acknowledge she says to him 
أين الله which translates to where is Allah and the child who is barely able to speak he does this في السماء في السماء and في السماء the preposition في has two meanings by the way either to be included in like when I say في جيبي mm -hmm. in my pocket mm -hmm. and this is definitely not intended here That's because right. nothing of Allah's creation can That's surround can him mm -hmm. And the second meaning is on top. So, fissama meaning on top of the highness. So, Allah is the high. There's nothing above Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ch children of this young age, they know this. Why? Because the parents are programming, are teaching, are installing in their child to have these wonderful uh, uh, meanings. So, Whatever you teach your child, Quran, prayer, fasting, uh, uh, moral conduct, and the child adopts it, you get rewarded for that. These are some of, well, we have more if you wish. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm thinking about here, we have um, the hadith about everyone being a, a sort of a shepherd responsible for their own flock. So this can go either, either way, you know, um, if you, inshallah ta'ala, raise righteous children, you get the reward of that. But if it goes the opposite way, you can also, you know, take on sins and take on uh, the, act, the acts in which they were disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this, in this regard, to which degree is a, a father or a mother responsible for the child? Uh, what are some things that you can do to ensure that I have fulfilled my amana, my right, and whatever you do after this is on you? Or does this extend to a certain age in America? We have this thing where when a child is 18, I'm free. You know, like you're, on, you're an adult now. And, uh, and Islam is not like this. Uh, so how do we navigate these, these sort of... Uh, well, Sheikh Yusuf, ideas. this is problematic. Mm. Simply because there isn't any specific age limit. Yeah. And there isn't any clear directive. It is our responsibility to shepherd, to take care of those who are under us. So as long as my son or daughter are living under my roof, eating from my food, they must abide by my instructions as a, as a father. Yeah. And this is one of the biggest problems in upbringing the children because your fingers are not alike. They're different, though it, they're mine and it's in my hand. Yeah. Likewise, your children are not the same. Some of them are obedient and kind and humble. And these are the coolness of the eyes yeah. and the heart to their parents. I have children that I make dua for every single night because they're so loving and caring that I would give my life for them. And unfortunately, there are children who are disobedient, mm. who are rebellious. And not only they are disobedient and rebellious to my orders and instructions as a father, but to Allah's commands and to the Prophet's teachings, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is a big problem. Can we draw the line and say, well, they chose this course of life to themselves or not? This is an issue of ishtihad. Mm -hmm. Some look at it and say that, no, you can't. The, you are the shepherd. And either they follow your way or the highway. Mm. But this is not applicable unless your way is the way of the Quran and the Sunnah. Yes. Not because Simon says. Yes. So if they're disobedient to Allah Azza wa and you instruct them and you order them and they fail to comply and you take a stance, yeah, you're on the right track. But again, there has to be diplomacy. There has to be uh, uh, weighing the pros and cons so that you don't take an impulsive decision you regret to the rest of your life. Yet again, it is an important issue to be tackled and it's not one glove that fits all. Yeah. You have to look at each, each and every scenario separately and independently. 
Thank you, Sheikh Asim. We uh, benefited much from your extensive knowledge today and your wisdom. Unfortunately, this is the end of our episode, but we thank our guests for joining us on our episode of Life's Adornments. Inshallah ta'ala, stay tuned for our next episode with our wonderful guest, Sheikh Asim. Thank you very much. And until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ooh.